Ladies and gentlemen, today's video is about the far right attempting to hijack the works of one J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, once upon a time, to even discuss this topic would have been to give the scum of the earth attention they do not deserve. Sadly, this is 2018. It waited. Darkness crept back into the forest of the world, whispers of a nameless fear. I am, however, a believer that sunlight is the best disinfectant, even if it means trekking into the depths of darkest angband, in order to defend an author who I'm actually quite fond of. Listen, long-famed Ring Lords, to the tale of how this first came to be. Okay, basically, Tolkien wrote a book. It's called Lord of the Rings. You may have heard of it. It's a book heavily derived from Tolkien's background in Norse and Germanic mythology. And we will get to this bit later. Allegedly features a collection of lily-white heroes stalwartly defending civilization against the oncoming tide of dark-skinned monsters. In light of this, as I said, we will, get, we will address the truth of the matter later, in light of this, one can rather imagine the far right getting positively orgasmic about this book. One can imagine them banging the bishop to it on a long and lonely night after they have already mangled Nietzsche and ruled over Wagner. Hold on, this needs to be sorted. Where did I put my rifle? Oh, there it is. So what do I mean by hijacking? Well, I essentially mean a two-pronged attack. The first prong of their attack is they try to smear J.R.R. Tolkien to make it look like he's one of them. Why do they do this? Simple. J.R.R. Tolkien is popular, and they are not. Fact is, nobody likes the far right. Nazis. I hate these guys. Because at the end of the day, despite all their prattling about being the saviors of Western civilization, fascists are just a bunch of thugs and nitwits and people who get off on others' pain. But wait, you say, surely if fascists are so weak and pathetic. Why on earth do they seem to be doing so well at the moment? Why do the forces of darkness seem to be advancing? And the answer to that is again also quite simple. Because fascists lie. They know full well that no one supports their agenda of guns, genocide and gas chambers. This which is why, basically, they have to hide in the shadows. The second they reveal who they are, they get squashed. It also, by the way, means that they refuse to even call themselves the far right, hence the multitude of names that they invent for themselves to replace that. The far right's fondness for lies also, bring, also brings me on to the second prong of their attack, namely an attempt to try and co-opt the work itself. Now, as I have said, the far-right agenda is ultimately deeply unpopular. So they try to invoke something that is popular, in this case, Lord of the Rings. The problem, of course, is that the Lord of the Rings is fun. It's deep. It's interesting. It's everything fascism is not. As such, they are reduced to having to misrepresent what is in there. They have to pretend that it somehow expresses their worldview, their 
doctrine of racial conflict. The remainder of this video will look at three separate areas. Firstly, we will take a look at how the far right operates in terms of smearing Tolkien the man directly. Secondly, we will take a look at the text of Lord of the Rings itself to debunk the notion that the text is somehow about a race war. And thirdly, we will take a look at the well-meaning but ultimately self-defeating tendency of certain people on the left to give the far right ammunition in this area. So let's get started. The nasty little rumour floating around the internet that Tolkien had a 20-year subscription to British far-right magazine Candor, which was edited by A.K. Chesterton, cousin of the more famous G.K. Now, if you Google this allegation, you'll find that it resurfaces in certain books. Now, none of these books are reputable at all. They are all written by the far-right, for the far-right. And even the tamely titled Tolkien and Politics is nothing of the sort. It's simply a, fr it's simply a fringe publication put out by social credit nutjobs trying to claim Tolkien as one of their own. But where did these books get the idea for connecting Tolkien with a far-right magazine? Turns out they all come from the same source. And sorry guys, this is the point at which we really are having to go to delve into the very depths of Angband. Turn back now if you value your sanity. It turns out that the source is an article by one Stephen Goodson, writing for Spearhead magazine in August 2002. Spearhead magazine was, until 2005, the mouthpiece of British neo-fascist John Tyndall and his Associated National Front and British National Party allies. Goodson is a Holocaust denier and Hitler admirer, leads South Africa's abolition of income tax and Ursary Party, and claims to have picked up Tolkien's collection of candle magazines from the editor's old secretary in 1997. Now, at this point, you could be forgiven for just screaming, this is bullshit. Some South African neo-fascist has got himself hold of some magazines that allegedly once belonged to J.R.R. R. Tolkien, and British neo-Nazis have then gone and ran with it because, well, it provides them with validation. And you would be right. It is complete and utter bullshit. Okay. Indeed, it would be rather like me claiming that I had the complete revised Fall of Gondolin in my basement, together with conclusive proof that Tolkien faked the moon landings in collaboration with the time-travelling Elvis Presley and Howard Hughes. Go on, plebs. Prove that I don't have that in my basement. Go on. I dare you. But let's pretend just for a moment that Goodson the Holocaust denier isn't simply pulling this issue out of his ass. Let's pretend for a moment that J.R.R. R. Tolkien, a man who actually had nothing nice to say about the British Empire, had a 20-year subscription to the House Journal of the League of Empire Loyalists. What does Goodson claim? Turns out he claims that Tolkien underlined some passages in Red Biro. Let's take a look at some of these things Tolkien allegedly underlined. Africa is not peopled by black Europeans, but is a continent full of tribes mentally and morally at the dawn of history. There should be only one source of money one fountainhead from which flows the nation's blood to vitalize commerce and industry, ensure economic equity and justice, and safeguard the welfare of the people. In other words, it has always been and still is our contention that the prerogative of creating and issuing the money of the nation should be restored to the state. By the way, that second paragraph sounds vaguely lefty until you realise that you're dealing with a far-right magazine 
going on about Jewish banking conspiracies. Because at the end of the day, Goodson is a fringe conspiracy nut, writing for fellow neo-Nazis. Let's pretend for a moment that Goodson isn't pulling this entire shit out of his ass. Let's pretend that those magazines really did belong to J.R.R. Tolkien, and that he really did underline certain passages in them, rather than, you know, somebody else in the 24 years that elapsed between Tolkien's death and Goodson allegedly getting his hands on these magazines? What can we then conclude? Stephen Goodson, who doesn't give a shit about the historical record anyway, he is, after all, a Holocaust denier, is so short of any form of evidence against J.R.R. R. Tolkien that he is reduced to making inferences about red biro marks. Sorry, Goodson, but underlining something in red biro does not mean that you agree with it. Though in this case, I certainly endorse the sentiment Tolkien did more than just write stories. He also wrote letters, and in those letters he expressed opinions. This conveniently allows us to compare Tolkien's actual opinions with Goodson's unsubstantiated allegations. Let's take a look at some of the things Tolkien actually wrote. I love England, not Great Britain, and certainly not the British Commonwealth. Grrr. Letter 53, December 1943. I know nothing about British or American imperialism in the Far East that does not fill me with regret and disgust. Letter 100, May 1945. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like someone who does not particularly mourn the British Empire. So, let's take a look at something Tolkien actually wrote in terms of race. I have the hatred of apartheid in my bones. Valedictory Address, 1959. As for what you say or hint of local conditions, I knew of them. I don't think they have much changed, even for the worse. I used to hear them discussed by my mother, and have ever since taken a special interest in that part of the world. The treatment of colour nearly always horrifies anyone going out from Britain, and not only in South Africa. Unfortunately, not many retain that generous sentiment for long. Letter 61, April 1944 I do not regard the probable absence of all Jewish blood as necessarily honourable, and I have many Jewish friends and should regret giving any colour to the notion that I subscribed to the wholly pernicious and unscientific race doctrine. Letter 29, July 1938. Underline those in red, Goodson, because those are Tolkien's actual opinions. But remember the Goodson reference to investing monetary power in the state? Turns out that we can dig up a, quote, a Tolkien quote on that too. I would arrest anybody who uses the term state, in any sense other than the inanimate realm of England and its inhabitants a thing that has neither power, rights, nor mind, and after a chance of recantation, execute them if they remained obstinate. Letter 52, 29th of November, 1943. So, looks like Tolkien actually had little time for either racism or fringe conspiracy nuts. Sorry, Goodson. Oh, and by the way, there were three at rings for the Elven Kings. Not five. Actually read the fucking book. Now, Tolkien's hatred of allegory is pretty well known. As far as he was concerned, the meaning of a text was there for the reader to decide, not for the author to hammer in. Now, as a reader and writer myself, this is a sentiment I largely agree with. I mean, I'm pretty left-wing myself. In fact, very left-wing. However, I have no problem at all with Christian conservatives or classical liberals or distributists or whomever finding things 
that appeal to them within the pages of the book. After all, Tolkien himself was pretty conservative. But I will be buggered if I'm going to sit here and let a bunch of racist fuckwits steal the text out from beneath my feet. Because what happens when you open up the pages of Tolkien? You actually find that most of the villains, when they're not dragons or giant spiders or fallen archangels, most of the villains are in fact white themselves. I mean, you've got Saruman the White, with his sigil of the White Hand. You have his lackey, Wormtongue. You have Arfalazurn, the last king of Numenor, who was tricked by Sauron into invading Valinor. You have Maeglin the traitor of Gondolin. Then you have the dark-skinned good guys. I mean, you have Garn Beri Garn and his Woses, for instance. And if you can't remember them from the movies, that's because Peter Jackson went and cut them. Bastard. As a reminder, Garn Beri Garn and his Woses live in Druidine Forest on the border of Rohan and Gondor. Now, uh, the Woses have essentially endured 500 years of harassment, of being hunted like beasts by the Rohirrim. And unsurprisingly, this has created a fair amount of historical animosity between the two peoples. However, there is one, there is one thing that Garn Beri Garn and his people hate more than the Rohirrim. It is the Orcs. And essentially what you have in the case of Lord of the Rings is a common enemy. The Rohirrim and Garn do a deal. Garn will show the Rohirrim a back doorway to Minas Tirith. Um, in return, the Rohirrim will, will promise to leave Garn's people alone forever after. And it's a deal both sides keep. Garn helps the Rohirrim get to Minas Tirith, and the rest is history. The good guys win the Battle of Pelennor Fields, and for their part, the Rohirrim agree to leave the Woses alone. Um, Aragorn even later goes and um, gifts the forest in its entirety to Garn and his people. All told, it's a quite heartwarming story of interracial collaboration in the face of a common enemy. When you stop to think about it, it's almost enough to make a fascist's head explode. Wait, you say, aren't Sauron's hordes dark-skinned? Well, for starters, the orcs straight out aren't human. And if you think they are somehow a metaphor for dark-skinned people, I refer you to the previous comment about Garn Beri Garn, because Tolkien was perfectly capable of writing dark-skinned people as, you know, dark-skinned people. The Lord of the Rings, as Tolkien said time and time again, is not supposed to be an allegory. More complicated, however, is the issue of Sauron's human followers. For instance, the Haradrim are quite clearly mostly brown, versus the good guys, the Rohirrim and Gondorians, who are mostly white. To which I would make two points. First point, there's actually a very famous scene in the book where Sam Gamgee encounters a dead Haradrim soldier that has been killed by Faramir's bunch. And Sam actually thinks to himself, about whether, in fact, this dead guy was indeed truly evil, or whether he was literally being forced from his home against his will to travel hundreds of miles to die in the name of Sauron's service. Now, it's quite an interesting scene because I think the implications that Tolkien is making very much lean towards the second interpretation, and that ultimately, people in Middle-earth will get along just fine, just fine at a cultural level, 
so long as there is no manipulative fucklet messing shit up. Second point I would like to make is what happens if you go and read the appendices. Now, yes, I am invoking geekery here, but I believe that the appendices can certainly shed some light on what is actually going on in Lord of the Rings. Specifically, the fact that the Haradrim and others kind of have a point. You see, whereas the Dunlendings and the Woses have been screwed over by the Rohirrim for some 500 years, the Haradrim and the Easterlings have been screwed over by the Gondorians for thousands of years. Recall that the Gondorians had a, success, had a succession of kings called South Conqueror or East Conqueror. Because never forget that Gondor is the last relic of what amounts to a brutal colonial empire. The Numenorean Empire, and Tolkien does not mince words here, the Numenorean Empire was slave-based. They Numenor came, took slaves, dragged them back to Numenor, and operated their society on that basis. That is not a very admirable society. And dare I say it, when Sauron comes along, and thoroughly and sincerely, of course, tells the, Dunland, tells the um, Easterlings and Haradrim, hey, this is your one big chance to, to, for payback, the, the Haradrim and the Easterlings are going to jump at the chance, just as the Dunlandings jump at the chance to help Saruman. And again, they kind of have a point. You can kind of understand where they are coming from. The other point that you will find if you read the appendices is that several hundred years earlier, Gondor itself had a quite vicious civil war called the Kinstrife. Now, this was essentially a conflict between people who thought that interracial marriage was fundamentally problematic, that Numenorians should not be interbreeding with the local population. The other side thought that interracial marriage was just fine, that there was absolutely no issue with Numenorians, um, you know, breeding, uh, breeding with, other, with other people. So there was civil war over this. Um, and what was interesting is that, much like Harry Potter, the blood purists are portrayed explicitly as the bad guys. They are tyrannical usurpers who, are, who, who commit murder and are eventually driven out um, to hang out with the other renegades in Umbar. By contrast, the Numenorians who thought that, you know, interracial marriage is just fine, are portrayed as, you guessed it, the good guys. So, in short, The Lord of the Rings is, quite explicitly, perfectly fine with interracial marriage. What can we conclude out of this? Simple. Tolkien was not writing a race war. Now, I've gone into some detail about, you know, the right, well, the far right, sorry attempting to co-opt Tolkien for its own purposes and the way in which the actual material itself conflicts radically with what they are trying to do. However, at the end of the day, this attempted co-option by some fringe nutters would not register on anybody's radar. It would be simply ignored were it not for the assistance they get from well-meaning but rather foolish people on my side of the fence, the left side of the fence. You see, there exists a certain type of political radical who seems to think that popular culture, you know, books, movies, or what have you, exists to parrot back the moral righteousness of one's own moral position which is obviously problematic. This means that it is now quite popular in certain circles to bash Tolkien's treatment of racial and political issues. A good example of this um, can be found in the accusation that Tolkien's dwarves are an anti-Semitic stereotype. 
Now, time is ticking, but I will emphasise that Tolkien's dwarves are fundamentally Norse in conception, right down to their names being taken from the Elder Edda. He, Tolkien was not intending his dwarves as a commentary on Jews. Yes, in some interviews in later life, he did draw parallels between his dwarves and the Jewish people, but in those cases he was primarily thinking of the dwarves as having lost a homeland, of having kept an ancient private language. Tolkien was first and foremost a language nut. He was not, he, Tolkien was not thinking in terms of nasty anti-Semitic stereotypes. And quite frankly, the analogy should not be pushed very far at all because the dwarves and the hobbit eat pork. You know, these are not particularly kosher dwarves. Insofar as we know about Tolkien's generalized views of the Jewish people, we have surviving letters from, for example, 1938, where a publisher from Nazi Germany wrote to Tolkien asking him if he had any Jewish ancestry. Now, Tolkien himself had very little time for the Nazis, as you can probably guess, so basically ripped them a new one. In the event, The Hobbit, which was the book in question at the time, remained unpublished in Nazi Germany. It, was not, it did not arrive in Germany until after the war. And I think, I think it's worth perhaps quoting a lovely little comment that Tolkien made during the war itself. I have in this war a burning private grudge, which would probably make me a better soldier at 49 than I was at 22 against that ruddy little ignoramus Adolf Hitler. Ruining, perverting, misapplying and making forever accursed that noble northern spirit, a supreme contribution to Europe which I have ever loved and tried to present in its true light. Letter 45, 9th of June, 1941. Take that, Nazis. You ruin something Tolkien loves, and he hates your guts for it. As for my fellow lefties, who like to bash Tolkien on this particular topic, for fuck's sake, find something better to do with your time. Did it never occur to you that there are any number of actual anti-Semites out there who would love to claim Tolkien for one of their own? Did it never occur to you that by bashing Tolkien for bullshit, you are essentially doing the far right's job for it? Speaking of the left being useful idiots for the far right, Michael Moorcock, fantasy author and anarchist, liked to get attention by calling Tolkien a crypto-fascist. Now, I've already cited Tolkien's own views at quite considerable length, so I won't do, them, won't do so again. However, one thing I would like to point out here is that by, by accusing Tolkien of crypto-fascism, Moorcock is arguably normalising crypto-fascism. What Moorcock fails to realise is that if people think Tolkien equals fascist, then people will also think fascist equals Tolkien. Suddenly, the far right gets to claim credit for the wonders of Middle Earth and all the respectability that comes with that. Never mind Tolkien himself rolling over in his grave. If we as a society seed popular culture to sinister forces, if we allow these fuckwits to co-opt, you know, popular culture, then we as a society are essentially allowing some very dangerous ideas to become completely and utterly mainstream. Moorcock here isn't merely wrong, he's actually being completely irresponsible. Now, this is not to say that Tolkien did not have his share of embarrassments over the years. The guy, at the end of the day, was human, and calling him up on the stupid stuff he said, or wrote, or did, that's perfectly fine. Though you're probably not going to change his mind very much, seeing as he's been dead for 45 years. What I would suggest, however, is that going around flinging words like 
crypto-fascist or anti-Semite atom willy-nilly has the quite severe potential for backfiring. There is only one lot of people who will benefit from the normalization of racism. Remember that fascists, the real ones, not the, one, not the ones living in Michael Moorcock's head, are perpetually trying to validate themselves and their sick belief system. It's their only way out of the gutter, and they will latch on to anything popular in an effort to try and make themselves appear normal and respectable. We can't let them do that. Don't give them a sniff. So Tolkien hated racist fuckwits and had nothing to do with them in his own lifetime. He did not subscribe to far-right magazines and he did not believe in bizarre and incomprehensible conspiracy theories involving Jewish bankers. His work, of course, is heavily rooted in Norse and Germanic mythology and he absolutely hated Adolf Hitler for what Hitler did to that mythology in terms of using it for such despicable ends. In short, none of this should actually be an issue. The fact that it continues to be an issue is simply because the far right keep, of course, trying to hijack Tolkien, and quite frankly, the, the far right, as far as I'm concerned, need to be fought at every opportunity. But just as worryingly, because of certain sections of the left keep trying to do their best, to help the far right achieve its aims. For God's sake, people, grow a brain. My own personal advice, simple. Don't believe the lies and don't enable the fuckwits. So, thank you very much for watching and until next time, this is Flea from Nart. Do you think you are